أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله This is our third session in speaking about Mamalat and we are going to speak about uh, the prohibition of riba within the context of the politics of Mamalat If you notice we have followed a very particular uh, procedure in order to bring this matter forward we have started speaking about the foundations of Muhammad. The first, the first morning, yesterday, we focus on methodology, trying to understand how do we arrive to the sources, how do we reach the sources, and what do we expect from the sources. And uh, we made a particular emphasis in trying to understand how uh, today, a rationalistic approach to our science will be efficient and uh, how therefore most of the scholarship devoted to apply rationalistic uh, principles to Islam always becomes deficient, continuously deficient. In particular the attempt that uh, it followed later on in trying to understand the model from the method, we moved into the model. A model from Medina cannot be understood using the logic and the rationale of today's society. Just in the same way you couldn't understand the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, trying to apply to them our own value system in regard to what we understand by democracy or slavery or commercial practices, etc., etc. For, in order to understand the ancient Greeks, you have to be with the ancient Greeks. Now, while this vision, which is said it is anachronistic to look into a period from the values of another period, uh, while we cannot look at the society of Medina and try to understand it with our values, we can, and we're entitled, or we must, look at our society with the values of Medina. It is those values that matter to us, not ours. It's not what we have in front of you that it has been now validated by, validated by law, but what was validated by the law then that matters to us in order to understand our own society. So we are anachronistic about our own society. We use Medina as the model. So that's why we try to close our eyes, I said yesterday, and try to walk in the city of Medina. Imagine the city of Medina with the markets and, and the currency and, and the contracts and try to understand how it was. If you understand this, if you understand the contextual reality, the living Medina, not a text in black and white, but the living city of Medina, then you have the context on which you can understand the text. The Hadith is contextualized. And then you can take, take a full flavor of what Medina was. Remember that we have only gone through headlines. It will take us more sessions like this, perhaps more weekends, to examine the whole matter of the souks. Beautiful subject. Beautiful subject. We are just, we just stopped by saying, these markets are wakaf. That's enough. That's enough to come today and speak about the politics. That's enough. We are saying, about money. There is a lot of things to say about money. But we stop just by saying the people are free to choose. Freedom. That's enough. Because we are in a situation where none of these things exist anymore. With the caravans, we didn't go into the details of the caravan, a fascinating subject. I mean, so fascinating, we are talking about the profession of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Something beautiful, spoken in the Quran. We are just saying they were there. And there was a place in the free marketplaces where they could trade. That's amazing. And we stop there because we think it's enough. It's enough. And Kirat was, we say, 99% of all the contracts, and this is my way of saying there must be an exception, the contracts of Kirat were practiced routinely in normality within the context of the caravans. And what follows is, if you take the caravans, then Kirat gets, it has to be, you have to switch into some other domains. 
And if you take the markets, the caravan has to defuminate into something else, individual traders. But it's not caravan anymore. So we have enough elements with these just headlines in order to make a critical analysis of our society now. What I'm trying to say is that by no means the subject is closed. In its depth, there's a lot more things in these affairs that they, they are worth a continuous study. But our emphasis, again, I have to say it twice or three times or 20 times if necessary, we are different in method because we are saying this is our wawasan duapolo duapolo. This is our wawasan. This is what we want. Is Medina Monawara. Everything else is contingent. This is the epitome. This is, this is what we want. I don't want to become an industrial society. I want to become Medina Monawara. And then everything comes into place. We, we are also saying we don't buy this wholesale idea that development means you put in the same package electricity and river. I talked about this before. But that's how it was sold to, to us. This is all technology developed with us. Here's the banking system and here's electricity. And we say, no, we keep the electricity, you keep river. You know, it's not the same. Well, we come to now today to, the, to discuss one matter, which is extremely important. And I, I call this in the politics of Islam because I hope at the end of this day, we understand that the politics of society is founded upon this question. There is no other politics. In other words, there is no other social issue of greater importance than the prohibition of riba. And I hope that in the process of this hour, I am capable of demonstrating this point. I am saying in a most emphatic way that any other political issue of any consideration, it, takes, it, it is postponed before the mighty importance that this issue of Riva has today. I'm going to say, I'm going to hope to demonstrate that Riva has shaped, has deformed our societies over the last 300 years, and it is by far the biggest, most important element in the reshaping of other political issues, such as, for example, the creation of nations, nationalism, including wars. The wars have been at the service of this enormous monster that it has been created in the background. From First, from first World War in particular, First World War, Second World War, and may I preserve us from it, Third World War, if it is to come. Money has become the number one instrument of slavery of the people in the world. It has become so dominant, so dominant, that despite all the religious prohibitions that extend to every serious religion, every religion in the world, except perhaps Mormonism, because they don't have a clue, but Christianity or uh, Judaism, most particularly, they forbid emphatically riba. You find this tradition if you investigate it almost everywhere, from the Sumerians, uh, way before Islam, and uh, Aristotle speaks on the matter. Uh, there are abundant sources, almost from every conceivable culture, saying, whatever you do, don't rent money. You cannot rent money. Money is not something that you can give to somebody and expect something in return. Islam, as we will see, takes this definition of riba. He defines, clarifies in details that they are absorbing. Incredible details. I would say never before in history, ever, there is a, a legal code so, so descriptive of this matter of riba as you find in Islam. Nothing. Nothing compares. So if we were to find a, a proper understanding of riba, on any account, from an historical perspective, Islam is the source. It, it highlights everything that has been said before by any other prophet, or it has been preserved by tradition from whatever source. That riba is a dominant phenomenon, it is precisely 
one of the, of the proofs of this is that they have overcome every legislation in the world. It's extraordinary. They have managed to transform religions, suppress religions for a time, and then when they could, they reform religions. This, this idea of Islamic reform or Christian reform or reform in general, I, I have to say, the fundamental issue in terms of social affairs, the impact of people, of all form of religious reform, is the legalization of river. And I have to conclude that this is the purpose of any religious reform. Even though it may be accompanied with other criteria, more or less significantly, if you compare in particular, and it's very important to understand river, to understand the, the phenomenon of religious reform, which I examine in great detail in my book, uh, The Esoteric Deviation in Islam, the Christian reform and the Islamic reform, see the parallels, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming, it's almost like the same tablet is used once again. The same criteria, the same methods, the same conclusions, the same morality. You know, but one element, always the same. The Christianization of banking, the Islamization of banking. And then, for some reason, the woman get all the an, an inimaginable pressure, as if it were they are responsible for whatever catastrophe society has encountered. So, uh, from the point of view of the of the economics, it is undoubtedly the number one factor that dominates society today. I mean. Uh, while they, they are perhaps now more clear than ever before, they are in a tremendous popular voice saying the politicians don't mean anything. It's not the banking system. I'm talking about the West because they have realized they have moved from one party to the other, from the Democrats to the liberal to the to the Republicans, or in the West from you know conservatives to Labour, uh, whatever is the dichotomy. In, in any other country, and they keep moving from one to another, hoping that a change takes place and nothing happens. We have seen the left and right fantasy in the light of river. They are both the same, as we will come to understand. But in this false dialectic of left and right that has dominated politics for at least 100 years, uh, we have seen that uh, theoretically left um, governments have privatized the central bank, like Gordon Brown in Britain, uh, or you know policies from Margaret Thatcher that they are in, entirely socialistic, left, because it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything at all. And uh, that is part of the blinding process upon which we the, the importance of the banking system is always hidden behind. That the banks have a very great power, and this is trying to escape the whole idea of conspiracy theory, because let us state it absolutely clearly, they have no power. The only conspiracy I believe in, Allah has all the power. Yes, there is, there is a hand, there is a power, above all the powers, that controls everything in the world, and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he has no second. There are secret societies, and there are the Bilderbergers, and there are these trilateral commissions, and, uh, and there are dynasties of Jews that they have dominated uh, banking, clearly, uh, but they are not in power. This is absolutely, totally false. And the proof that they are not in power is that despite their trillions, they still think they are not in power. If you ask them, they say, no, no, we need another 20 trillion in order to make absolutely sure that we control everything. It, if, if we could uh, you know, destroy every other nation, then we will be truly in power. It doesn't matter how much they own and they possess, they themselves feel everything is slippery and going totally against them, which is talk completely true. Because what they do is against nature. It's contra naturam, echoing the, the poet Ezra Pound. They are there. The, the financial systems that they control and manipulate, they are awesome. They're way above the economy of people, the economy of the planet that they dominate uh, uh, currencies, money, politics, by the money, is, is natural. And yet, they have no power. 
They have the power of illusion. They, have, they are as powerful as the printed paper in which the dollar is, is manifested. They have nothing. It's very important that we understand that. But that the banks, the bankers, the banksters, as they say, some people say in America, the banksters, that they dominate uh, the American politics. Let's take, for example, the, the present government of Obama. They call it the Wall Street government. And they're quite right, because they, they are mostly Golden Sachs and Wall Street. I mean, ironically, the people that the government then later on undertook to bail out the voice in this direction is, is overwhelming, it's very clear. And uh, that the people in America, they don't say anymore Democrats or Republicans, many argue. The issue is people versus Wall Street. That uh, uh, banking has been behind uh, uh, the major wars uh, is documented in, in helping both sides, <laughs> lending money to Iran and Iraq at the same time, to Nazi Germany and Soviet Union at the same time, etc., etc., etc. So, this is the most important political issue. The second thing we have to say is that it's the most taboo subject in existence. This matter cannot be mentioned. Uh, it, the absence of this matter in the political debate is what is the overwhelming reality that everybody refuses to bring this matter forward. Any other issue is encountered. Any other thing will be discussed, but not that what we are facing here is an enemy, neither that riba in Islam is the most forbidden affair after shirk. You just simply cannot talk about it. You have a very good reason not to talk about it because it starts the domino effect. If riba is really to be taken seriously, then, well, paper money goes down. Banks go down. Central banks go down. Constitution go down, goes down. Nationalism goes down. <sighs> is it what is left? You are left with nothing. The fact that these entity of banks have managed to legislate, to legislate, the acceptance, the legality of RIBA above in every corner of the world, in every country in the world, that's another awesome, awesomeness of the reality, the legal aspect. Uh, that is the creation of the constitutions. Nobody wants to look into the matter. <laughs> I mean, again, if you remember the first day I said, the genius of the West. Well, the genius of the West is, is to put you in prison and to say you are free. It's amazing. Call war peace. And we are killing in the name of peace. And uh, they can put somebody inside a complete, rigid, identical franchise of, uh, uh, of, of law without the people even understanding. No, even, even not just that so, but to sell it to the people as merdeka. I mean, you have to admit, this is, it takes genius to do that. Nobody would sit down for a second and say, how can men can sit down and create a law above the Quran? It is unacceptable. Below the Quran, you can write whatever you like, but not above the Quran. Yet, it is everywhere. One case that I particularly find interesting is the, consti the constitution of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. It's my favorite one. Because there you, you see it. It's just absolutely awesome. The first article of the constitution says, without any question, the sovereignty belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Islam is the supreme law, full stop. Okay? If the constitution ends up there, it would have been the best constitution ever written. But it doesn't end up there. There is an article 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. So the next article comes and says, and you have a central bank. 
Now, that's a little bit of a problem. Then the second one, and by the way, the, the government can tax you uh, even if you don't understand how good it is for you. And then uh, the, the central bank will reserve the capacity to print the money that uh, is, is, is obligatory on all of you because you cannot really choose properly. We do it for you. And then it has another article that says, uh, any interpretation of Islam will be done by a Sharia council according uh, to the principles of the constitution. And this is where the whole thing starts going around. Because now any interpretation of Islam has to be in accordance to the constitution. But taking these articles being in place, we have a problem. But since this committee reserves to themselves the interpretation, the final interpretation, you have to admit that a new Islam has been written from day one. Whereby you have to submit to this central bank paper money and national debt, which I forgot. The government will be able to indebt you on your behalf until uh, as much as they can. Which is against Islam. Um, this is without ignoring, for example, things like secular elements of society, like the division of the two courts, you know, the Sharia court and the civil court. <coughs> Which, you know, any commercial aspect that it has to be judged, not only here in Malaysia, in Pakistan too, if it is something commercial, you go to a, a, you know, as if it were a secular court. If it is something to do with marriages and deaths, you go to the Sharia court. I mean, don't you see already clearly, don't you see clearly what is, what is happening? Is that the matters of economics, the riba included, is taken out of the Sharia. It cannot be understood with the Sharia is not compatible with the Sharia, for some strange reason, the Sharia cannot possibly understand what's going on. <laughs> and everybody accepts it. This is in the Constitution, too. And then things like uh, nationality, that you take for granted. Okay? They say, no, human rights, racism is bad, but nationalism is wonderful. So this man is born here, is Malay, is 100% Malay, but happens to be 200 meters away from this magical line in the middle of the jungle, and he's now Thai from Patani. And he's my cousin, but I happen to live in this other side, and I am Kelantanese. We have the same religion, we are the same people. Never mind. We didn't do that. And if you ask who did it, it's, it's politically incorrect. And to take care of them, as if it were our family, is politically incorrect, and so on. This is all derived from this nationalistic nonsense that appears again in the constitutions. It was accepted wholesale by the population, naturally, for all it was happening to them. In their view, it was, well, we are changing these English faces from these Sultan faces. So, I mean, I'd rather have the Sultan here with me to these politicians. I'd rather have them. What it was never understood is that they were coming with a package. They were forced to come with a package. Now, that's ugly. It doesn't matter how you want to look at it, because we are talking about recent history. These faces are still there. Okay? And the Constitution is, of course, underneath your seat. You're sitting on it. You cannot escape from it. But it cannot be critically understood from an Islamic point of view. If you want to understand where the constitutions come from, all you have to do is to look at the history of Europe, because it was not embedded in Shah Alam. Neither was embedded in Karachi. Constitutions were invented in the West. And the, the, the principle, the humanistic philosophy that uh, uh, lay underneath its creation, it was the belief that mankind is now mature. They argue, for thousands of years, we had a God that it was telling us what to do. But now, we're not children anymore. We don't need daddy to tell us what to do. So now, we make our own laws. This is emphatically, if you read the, the people of the time of the Enlightenment, where all these ideas originate, they are saying we don't want God. Constitutionalism is anti-religion. 
it's it therefore, under any rational definition that you can give to religion, is anti-Islam. How, therefore, then you can speak about an Islamic constitution? It's like Islamic banking. It's like Islamic whiskey. It's a contradiction. All right? But, now here comes the big deal. You have the constitution in place. Okay? So, the, the, the law already ignores any aspect regarding commercial activities to be interpreted according to the Sharia. It is emphatically according to sets of law that the British left behind. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? You have not given a chance of understanding what Islamic law or Muamalat is. It was already out. And then you have lived for 40 or 50 years, a bit more, 70 years, no less, 60 or something years, under this new constitution. The ulama that they have to leave inside this prison, they have no encouragement, no interest in learning everything about Muhammad because it's not applicable. The only thing that is left for them is personal morality. So they have to read every conceivable book about, you know, particularly fame, uh, personal behavior into how do you get dressed. For some reason, this is so exciting. I don't see the, the excitement, but they get really excited with the whole idea of the dress code. What you do, what you cannot do, etc., etc., and this and the other. And the scarf in particular. I mean, one of the things that, for example, I found really shocking is that the enormous emphasis on the scarf and not on the trousers. <laughs> when the issue of the trousers is absolutely, totally looked upon with, uh, as a complete rejection. And you go to Kelantan, for example, and you find these g lovely girls, you know, completely up to here with tight jeans everywhere. <laughs> Which is really absurd. You take a picture of that, and it's kind of absurd, totally absurd. With, what it really tells you is that the whole thing has become so formalistic, it is deprived of any rationale. It's not about modesty, it's just it's, it's a kind of uniform. Like the Communist Party, you know, they had to go all these, in this same stuff. So you have to kind of follow the uniform. But what it's about, that's another thing. This formalism, this strict, strict formalism on tiny little things of the law is, is what happens when you have the ulama that they cannot think of anything else. It's the only thing they have a possibility of ruling. The woman. You can suddenly, this is where I can really be myself. You know, telling them what to do. They cannot go and say to the banks, you are not doing right. They cannot go to and say to the government, you are corrupt. They are not allowed to say to, to, to the expenditure, the corrupt expenditure that's happen, that is happening today, this is unacceptable Islamically. They cannot speak about any social or political matter. They can only speak about how, men, how women get dressed. Do they get obsessed? Of course they get obsessed. Because, because you force them into obsession. You force them into obsession. And no wonder then, the people in the West, when they think about Islam, all they can think of is the hijab. As if, you know, this is who these guys are. They are just cannot have it enough. We are totally right in defending the hijab. 100%. What we, it doesn't make sense is that is our monolithic only one issue. That and Palestine. And that's it. This is who we are. If you, for example, the Islamic party, you examine what they speak about in every speech, is either one of these two subjects. The hudud, for example. The absurdity of how this matter is presented. I mean, where in the list of the hudud you find and all the banks are forbidden? Nowhere. Look at what they say. You know, we persecute the theft, the thing, and the other. How about the, you know, the cheating in the marketplace? How about the provision of ribbon? How about the lashes that is involved in this? The absolutely incredible toughness with which our caddies dealt with corruption. Incredible, incredible tough. How about now? Nothing. Nothing has been said on the matter. I mean, and and under any human understanding of the matter, from the most, the from any logic of, of 
compassion. How could you possibly imagine that you are going to punish somebody stealing a, a loaf of bread when you have somebody stealing 100 million ringgit and he goes unpunished? What society can possibly undertake such principles? And that is hypocrisy again. But it is the result of living inside the prison. As long as you don't question the Constitution, <laughs> then it doesn't make sense. And then, then the creation of Islamic banking. The creation of Islamic banking is natural. Because look, you have a constitution that says central bank is halal. And this is an Islamic constitution. Conclusion. They must be halal some way or the other. Okay? Well, our, the people, our traditional Shafi ulama, couldn't figure it out. It just it doesn't make sense. So let's bring another lot of people who make sense out of this. They will be enormously rewarded. They will find position, they will have time on television, prestige, fame, money, and jobs. Huh? So sooner or later, start coming in, popping in. You start creating the courses in the university, at least you know, they had a hard time to justify Islamic banking at the beginning. But now, is once you create a PhD on something, once you said you can always quote him, and then you just carry on. You know, from the initial ad, you just carry on. And the, the PhD method will allow you to go as, as, as bizarre as you can, they have already gone. But this, my point is that it's because we are inside the prison. It's because we live in this constitutional prison. It's because there is no choice. And, and you want to, the test of this, the proof of this, is that you go to the ulama, to the muftis, and you tell them, what is riba in demand for a definition? And they do not know. And this is the subject of our topic today. Is that this thing that we are going to speak about, when you finish out of here, you will belong to the 0.1% of the population who can articulate a classical definition of riba. Because the people don't know. But now, look at, look at the madness. If you cannot define riba, then the whole thing is nonsensical. It's, it's, you cannot grasp it. You cannot understand it. You, you, you cannot apply it. If you change the definition of riba, it's the same. This is, all these three things have happened. It has been ignored. It has been changed. It has been completely manipulated. It's not that reading the Mubata is difficult or, or, or Iman Shafi is that it's not applicable anymore. What you have to read is this Institute for Banking Development or whatever it's called. There are two or three in Malaysia. Malaysia, by the way, is one of the leading Islamic banking in the world. It's just kind of, Malaysia went bizarre in this way. No, nobody ever, not even the Arabs. You have been leading the Arabs or misleading the Arabs. It, it didn't originate in Malaysia, it started in Pakistan, but Malaysia went wholesale on this, absolutely, totally. With the creation of Islamic Bank, Bank Islam, then everything just went absolutely bizarre. It's the result of the condition of living. Just these matters that we will encounter today, therefore, they have been hidden, taken out. Just nobody knows, nobody is allowed to know. The same here as in Pakistan. Exactly the same thing. Now, it will be more shocking in Pakistan because in Malaysia, Islam is completely officialized. It doesn't exist outside the, the boundaries of, of the state. So it's owned by the state. The muftis are owned by the state. So it's the only version of Islam that is, is allowed to be given is the official state given sanction of le lesson of Islam. But it is not the same in Pakistan. In Pakistan, you have enough, a lot of independent, like in Indonesia too, you find muftis that they come from autonomous organizations, that they have their own wakf, they don't depend on the money of the government. And they have independent issue uh, capacity, so they have given fatwa. There is a fatwa on Islamic banking, saying it's haram, uh, signed by 150 ulama in Pakistan. Never mind, the official position of the government remains that Islamic banking is good. And the government is still pouring billions billions of dollars into Islamic banking in Pakistan. But at least, at least there is a voice. I've been running around trying to find out the people who are, could independently sign a fatwa saying something much minor, not saying Islamic banking is haram. I know that's too hard. 
just saying golden art is, is okay. <laughs> that, that, you know, is part of the Sunnah. And I couldn't get, except with two exceptions, I couldn't get anybody. It's not that they didn't understand. Some didn't refuse to understand. And you can see they were scared. And if you force them to say, please, they don't want to. They will lose the job. Okay? And a Mufti doesn't have any other job to do. He doesn't go and start you know, selling potatoes. So what happens is it, everything is rigidified. It's rigid around the official Islam, the, the government imposing its own interpretation. What happens to the people? Not a clue. Unless you make an effort, you will not be able to find out. So finally, I think I have concluded my initial argument. It is an important issue. And that's why we need to understand it. So what do we need to understand? The question is, what is riba? <coughs> definition of riba. Well, here is the classical definition of riba. It comes from Ahkam al Quran. So the, this definition is derived from the tafsir. The tafsir. Some of the tafsirs are specialized on the hukum, in the legislation that we find in the Quran. And it is understood that the prohibition of riba comes directly from the Quran. Well, halalahul baya wa haramul riba, that's pretty clear. So, logically, the next question is what is riba? And uh, from the tafsir of Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi, it's one of the most renowned, accepted classical scholars in Islam. Of the, among all the ahkams, this stands among the three most important. And he says, and this is a definition worth understanding and remembering literally. Then you can add more details into the matter, but it's worth understanding literally. Riba is any unjustified increment between the value of the goods given and the value of the goods received. In the actual tafsir, it says the counter value. The counter value meaning the goods received, the value of the goods received. Any unjustified increment between the value of the goods given and the counter value. Understood? So, what does it mean, increment? Increment in a transaction means that something has been added to the transaction that is not justified by its nature. Something has been added, but it shouldn't be there. Um, there are two types of additions that they can be brought into the contract, that they are not justified. One is known as fadl and the other one is called Nasiya. Fadl means disparity. It refers to the quantities. Nasiya means delayed. Delay, referring to the timing between the exchange of the goods. So occasionally, if you add timing to a transaction, it becomes riba. And uh, if you add an increase in the quantities, it becomes riba. Occasionally, meaning sometimes it's justified and some is, sometimes it's not justified. So if we go back to our, our original definition, is any unjustified increase or time of time or increase of disparity that is added to the religion, to the, to the transaction, to the value of the, between the value of the goods given and the value of the goods received. Now, riba al nasia and riba al fadl Unjustified. Explain unjustified. Unjustified means that sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's not justified. When and how? Well, the first we have to put examples to understand it. Uh, the first distinction you make in commercial contracts is between sales, these are goods of different genus, of different kind, 
potatoes for rice, potatoes for gold, gold for cars, etc., etc., sales, and transactions of the same kind, of the same genus. When you are given money and you receive money, when you give uh, a horse and you receive a horse, when you are either three type of transactions. Exchange, that's gold for gold or silver for silver, specifically about money. Lending, I give you gold or silver and you give it to me later. And rent, so I give you a horse and you give it to me later. And uh, as if it were, I don't know whether I can do this thing. But it will be maybe a little bit complicated. Look, it's not too difficult to say. I would like to write it, but I don't think it's necessary. In the case of exchange, In the case of an exchange, can, can you read this? Maybe from far away you can't. It says exchange loan rent against a table that says fatal on Asia. And the question is when it's justified and when it's not justified. Well, in the exchange, again, fatal is not justified. You cannot increase in a loan. In the case of the exchange, Nasia is not justified. In a loan, Fadl is not justified, but Nasia is justified. In the case of the rent, Nasia is justified and the rent and Fadl is justified. Okay. <coughs> is the, this simply this is very easy to understand it. And here you understand justified, not justified. In a loan, for example, I can lend you money and you give it to me in, in a month time. There is Nasia. You have increase in Nasia. Is it halal? It's 100% halal. But look, in an exchange, if I give you 100 dinars in the form of uh, tens, and you give me 100 dinars in 100 units of one, for example, if I exchange money to you like this, if you don't give me back the money as I give it to you, you give it to me instantly, then there will be a river of Nasia. So here, look, it's not that the Nasia is forbidden, it's, it's that you're cheating the other person. If you want the money from me, ask me for a loan. If you want to keep it before you give it back to me, ask me for a loan. And then, if I agree, I will give it to you. But if you call it exchange, then not even one second can be added. Like Omar Ibn Khattab said, if somebody exchanges money with you, and he says, wait, I'm going to go to my house, and pick up the money and then I give it back to you, Omar Ibn Akhtar said, if you don't follow him, it's haram. If you don't go to his house with him, in other words, you cannot depart. You have to be with him. Iman Malik says, if somebody puts the money on the table, okay, I say, I want to change the money, and the trader puts the money underneath it, and then brings it back again and puts the other one, it, this is not acceptable. <laughs> so, in other words, it's just... It has to be hand to hand, hand to hand, and equal for equal. Hand to hand, like this. You give it to me, I give it to you. No tricks. It, it sounds almost like excessive, but not when you're in the 21st century, when you realize what it can happen with that little second. Just say one second, times millions of transactions is everything. Of course, it's more than seconds. And then, uh, <clears throat> so that explains unjustified. So here, we have two types of riba. Riba al nasia and riba al fatal. Okay? Now, with this, we have the tools in order to make judgment. 
and we can come into this in great detail if you look at the at the at the book uh, that some of you I have seen you have the photo and banking you have a full description of this uh, I want to focus on on the things that I I want you to uh, highlight in terms of understanding regarding this matter and uh, allow you to then go on and investigate on your own on, on, on the actual details. The, the very next thing that it is important to understand is, is a chapter that is, is in the book too, is the modernist reinterpretation of Riva and Nasia. This is so important that, as you will see, is the reason why if any one of you is asked what is Riva, you will say interest. Full stop. And uh, this is universal. I mean, you ask ministers, you ask ulema, they will tell you interest. Not only in Malaysia, but in Pakistan. This origin is from a man called Rashid Reta. Rashid Reta. There is a beautiful book on the reinterpretation of Riva by the modernist scholars. Uh, modernism, how does it come into the picture? By Professor Niazi in Pakistan. Fantastic book about the prohibition of Riva, it's called. And he goes into the details and quoting all the different aspects, how this thing comes about, this monster, this new type of understanding. Well, the first thing is that you need to know who's Rashid Reda, because probably you don't know. Um, it comes from the triad of three Egyptian reformers that it was started with uh, Al Afghani, a Freemason, proven Freemason, and Mohammed Abdu, a proven Freemason, who became the the chief mufti of Egypt by Lord Cromer. Family name, Evelyn Baring. Baring from the Baring, Baring Bank, from the Baring family that owned Baring Banks, who had sent one of their children in order to make sure that the debt of Egypt was paid to the family first. And um, Rashid Reda is the third of this triad. He is responsible, he's known in history for doing two things. One is inventing the fantasy of Muhammad Abdu. Muhammad Abdu was nobody, he was a thug, it completely despised by his own people. Um, there is an incident where uh, Sheikh Elis uh, sees him coming into, as the Grand Mufti, he was the Grand Mufti then, and he comes into Al Azhar, and Sheikh Elis was a very old gentleman, and he stands up and he gets with his stick. And he hits him in the head and he says to him, Kafir, get out of here. <laughs> he was not popular by anybody. He was hated equally by the ultra-secular people as he was hated by the, the traditional ulama. Yet, he, he will become the king of fundamentalism. <laughs> the mother and father of all modernism as far as of Malaysia or Indonesia. This character by the virtue of Mohammed Reda, Rashid Reda. Rashid Reda was a journalist, was not an alim. And uh, he uh, uh, created the first magazine, pan-Islamic magazine called Al Manar, distributed by the privilege and of the British Empire. They would not allow this magazine to distrib be distributed without their consent. They had a very good reason to support it. And uh, Rashid Reda, uh, creates a fantasy. He just kind of idealized, like a movie fantasy, a Hollywood fantasy about a superhero called Mohammed Abdu, who was given all kind of Wali of Allah, you know, characteristics. Um, and um, something has been consequently done very, like, uh, you know, a Stalin in, during the days of the Soviet Union. So this idealized picture of Mohammed Abdu, totally fantastic is the number one achievement. The second one is that he rewrite the river. He completely rewrites it. Now what he does is, is out of malice or out of ignorance, 
But what he says is riba al nasia means the riba in the loans. You see? Is the riba of delay. You put delay. But he says, is the riba of because nasia means delay timing. So he says, is the riba that takes place in loans. But hold on. The only riba that can take place in loans is fatal. If you interpret riba al nasia as the riba that takes place in loans, then riba al nasia doesn't mean anything. The only thing that it means is interest. <laughs> huh? It only means interest. So he says the riba of the loans is interest. So riba al nasia is interest. 99% of all the websites with the name Islamic Banking in Malaysia, if you read what is the meaning of riba al nasia, will tell you interest. Why? Because they are all Ustads. Because you are all children of Mohammed Abdu. Not you, the ulama. That's why you call yourselves Ustads. Because Mohammed Abdu was given the title of Ustad al-Awal. The first Ustad. Okay, you don't know anything about this, don't worry. We will come to this point. But then the second thing is, from, from Rashid Reda comes, the, uh, when, he is, uh, when he dies, who is the next editor of Almanar, the magazine Almanar? Who do you think it is? Who? No, no, no. Who is the next? No, not Kutub. Hassan Albanna. And who is Hassan Albanna? Who is Hassan Albanna? Ikhwan al Muslimin. <laughs> is the fourth child in line. And what does he say? He repeats the argument word by word. The only thing he does, he does change, is for some strange reason, Rashid Reda, who, as I said, he's a journalist, he's not an alim. Uh, he says that uh, simple interest is halal, only compound interest. You understand the difference between compound and simple, right? So he says compound interest is haram, but simple interest is not haram. I mean, later on, they just they couldn't stand that. And they go back to single single interest is forbidden, and that's okay. So under this definition of Rashid Reda, Riba al Nasir is the Riba of the loans. And then the next question is what happened with Riba al Fatal? <laughs> and this is what you will find in the websites of Malaysia, which is exactly what Rashid Reda said. Riba al Nas Riba al Fatal is when two people exchange gold for gold. Exchange. But uh, nobody will exchange gold for gold, it doesn't make sense. Uh, or dates for dates. It's just an awkward thing that these people in the past did. It's so awkward that it's no longer relevant. So therefore, Rival Father is just one of those things lost in the past. And then, you know, they add and the river of Jahiliya, which is now they are putting it a category that doesn't belong to these two classical definitions. Rival Nasia, Rival al, al, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Jahiliya is seen as the third category which en endorses the idea of uh, it is partly related to the Riba al -Nasir. And that's it. This is what it's just thrown to the people. The people don't know what Riba al-Fatal is anymore. Riba al-Fatal is interest. That's it. Finish. End of the game. Now, in this process, what is missing? What disappears completely? Not Riba al-Fatal, because Riba al-Fatal has been renamed Riba al -Nasir. What is the one that, that really disappears? The one that really vanishes out of this fantasy nonsense is Riba al Nasir, the one that is stated all the time. It has vanished because it has become now interest. The question of delay disappears in the context of a description or analysis of Riba. Disappears, thanks to Rashid Reda. The literature, all, entire literature on Islamic banking in any corner of the world is based on the dictums of Rashid Reda and Ikhwan al Muslimin. Later, almost endorsed word by word by Jamaat al Islamiyya. And Jamaat al Islamiyya became the number one advocate of Islamic banking. That's why they found so hard when I speak with them to, they say, the gold dinar. And I said, and, is, and Islamic banking is haram. And they have agreed, all of them, the council of Jamaat al Islamiyya in Pakistan have agreed that it's haram. But they cannot say it in public. Because if they say it in public, the whole institution, the whole institution for 50 years has been a shame. 
And those in Pakistan, that they know the story, and they know my visits to Jamaat al-Islamiyah, they can confirm the same issues. Now, this is shocking, right? <laughs> it is shocking to me. So what happens is, Riva and Nasia disappears. I'm going fast, but I hope you are following my argument. If not, later in question and answers, please ask me, because this is something you need to understand. Riba and Nasia disappears. What is Riba and Nasia about? Well, there, there are two words in Arabic that you need to know. That it, it is the key to this Riba and Nasia issue. Is the word Ein and Dain. Ein and Dain. Um, do you understand Ein, right? Ein means tangible. Tangible. It is also synonymous to cash. So when you pay in cash, it means you pay with cash. You know, it's there. So you say pay in ein, mean right there. And dain, what does it mean dain? Dain means a debt, a promise, a liability. You know, okay, I will pay you later. That's paying in the dain. If you write a piece of paper, I owe you, that's dain. Okay? So here, what is important here in terms of the, the issue of Nasir, that in ein is there. But there is delay. When you pay with Ein, with an IU, there is a delay, right? It's halal, but it has limitations. So, what is paper money? Is it Ein or Dain? It's Dain. Okay, here it is. You cannot buy anything on delay terms with Dain because it's Dain for Dain, and Dain for Dain is haram. So when people say, can you buy anything on the late terms using Ringgit? Haram of the harams, of the harams of the harams, of the harams of the harams. Without any question whatsoever, and there is no school you cannot hide uh, underneath any corner. Dine for dine is haram, and there is no question on the matter. Can you buy anything of gold or silver? I mean, taking into account, let's say that... Paper money is not just a fraud, and it's a complete fraud. Let's give them the credit that there is actually a ring it behind. Okay? If you buy something which, with this dime of silver, which is not true, but if you do, you cannot buy gold and silver. Why? Because this is classic definition of riba. You, somebody gives you jewelry, and you pay it with dime of silver. It's haram. Ein Gold for gold, silver for silver, hand to hand, equal for equal. Gold for silver, equal for equal, uh, etc. Hand to hand. The hand to hand. When you exchange gold for silver, okay, there is a variation, naturally, there is an exchange between gold and silver, but hand to hand. If not, it's a river. Okay? So you cannot buy in the late terms at all. So jewelry shops out. Okay, any delay transaction, out. Can you pay zakat with dime? You cannot pay zakat with dime. You have to pay zakat with ein. Now, that is serious, because now we are talking about farther, okay? So, out of the picture. It's not allowed. Can you transfer dime? Can you just transfer it to another person? Only under very severe circumstances. Is called the transfer of debts. It can be done. You can actually pass it to another person. But the condition number one is that the originator, the person who owes the money, has to be present. Number one. If it is absent or dead, naturally, impossible. You get stuck with that paper money. Okay? If there is any doubt that the person may not be able to pay you, it is forbidden to transfer it, logically. Because you are just dumping, you know, as they say, a toxic asset. You're passing to somebody else something that cannot be paid. If you know in advance the central bank doesn't, cannot pay or doesn't have the money, if you know in advance that the central bank is not going to pay you back, and we know it for certain because they are saying we are not going to pay you back, it is impossible to pass this one from another person to another person. Completely forbidden. Why? Because you're cheating. 
universal cheating doesn't mean there is no cheating. <laughs> that everybody does it, it doesn't mean it's not cheating. That's Islamic law, okay? Now, what happens with the people who live inside the prison? They don't have, they, they cannot say anything of the things I just said, because it means the constitution is wrong. But hey, I don't reach that far. This is the taboo. In Pakistan, in the constitution itself, it says, to criticize the constitution of Pakistan is treason. Which is quite ironic, because you can say, for example, in Pakistan, I don't believe in God if you are a Hindu, or you can say an elephant is God, and, and this is perfectly fine. But you cannot say this constitution is against the people of Pakistan, or is a lie, because that's treason. You cannot criticize the constitution. That again, you have to chapeau to the British. You have to say, you are genius. I mean, you are really amazingly good. You totally lock them up, completely lock it up. You cannot allow the, it becomes really dogma, the constitution. You cannot change it. I mean, you need, it made it, in order to make a constitutional change, uh, you can reinterpret the Quran in 15 minutes. All you need is, is the Sharia Council of a private bank, which is awesome, awesome. Eh? The same people that you are dictating, you are making judgment, they employ you. It's like getting the thieves to pay for the judges. To say, I pay you and you tell me where robbing is halal or haram. But you are under my supervision and you are my Sharia Council. It is insane. I mean, nobody will ever do that or take it seriously. Never mind. It's everywhere in Malaysia. Sharia councils paid by the bank. It, the logic is very simple. If you don't give me the fatwa, I get somebody else. It, it's, it's, it's worse than that because the competition is not really whether it's halal or haram. That's done. It's the competition is that who is going to Islamize the credit cards? That's how you get the job. If somebody comes up with, I have a method, method to Islamize the credit card, then you get the job. And there are people there specializing, special, that they have the recipe to Islamize futures. They get the job. You follow. So the, the circumstances we find ourselves is that with the restriction given by the constitution, the Islam that originates in that little zone, in that little courtyard, you know, that little Islam that is allowed, that it goes, you know, you know hijab, hijab, and practically nothing else, and then riba is not my business. Within that little world that is allowed to exist, Islam is distorted, completely distorted. In order to, to have any say at all, they have to conform with the rules of the prison. Islam has to conform with the rules of the prison. And there it follows that if the banks are part of the system of the prison, it must be Islamic. And that's it. Whatever traces you had of Islam is gone. Gone, 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 gone. Then you have the government. The government telling you Islamic banking. The government endorsing Islamic banking. Then you have it everywhere. You, you say, you know, be a good Muslim. You know, the, the lady appearing in the front with, looking wonderful. And the other one, they are kafirs and oh, terrible. The same bank, the same bank, like CMB, can have one portal in red, as if it were red and green, and then you have the green Islamic and the red haram. But you look at the website, it's identical. The whole system is identical. The operation behind the thing is identical. When, when the, the, my favorite site is go to the, the part of the mortgages, and then you have the halal mortgages, the haram mortgage. The rate is identical. The only thing that changes is that in one says, the person who has done the software, he couldn't be bothered. So he well, just change the name, that's enough. And they change one, it says profit, and the other one says interest. And the whole Malaysian population carries on celebrating that we are free from riba. Unbelievable stuff. I mean, and this is a society that says to themselves, we are more clever than our grandparents. This, you know, they were in the, in the jungle, the, you know, they had nothing but a mango in their brain. We think we are clever. We think we are the clever ones. We, we have lowered ourselves beyond any consideration. The orangutan is more clever. 
we have gone back. The intellect has, has shrink. And we think we are, we are more educated in it. But we cannot think. You see, remember the first day? Thinking is the heart. You don't understand your heart. You cannot think. It's terrified. It's, terri it's, it's, it's terrifying. The idea that these muftis, they have been lying to you. It's terrifying. I know you must feel absolutely terrible. It's terrible. It's, it's un unthinkable that the constitution of Malaysia, that Merdeka doesn't exist. It must be terrifying. Because it's living in an enormous lie. It's terrifying. It's unacceptable. Okay, delete this man. Monday, this day, didn't exist. Let's go back to business as usual. You know, the, the, this man who is speaking to me right now, it must be bad. There must be something totally wrong on this. Don't worry, you, have no, you will have to spend no effort to disqualify me. All you have to do is to say, look, the majority of the ulama of Malaysia agree that Islamic banking is halal, so therefore that's it. That will be sufficient to carry on live, live, living as usual. And that's what most people do. They have heard, they have seen the gold dinar, but it's too much. It's just far too much. Where do you end? Thinking. That's why, you remember, we started all this conference saying it's not, a, it's not about reason. It's not that you are not qualified to think. It's not that you are not intelligent enough. Your IQ is high. But you cannot think. Thinking is something else. Thinking is to be able to understand the truth. The truth. Any way of thinking that doesn't allow you to investigate the truth is not thinking. Science cannot think, do you remember? You think with taqwa. If you need, if you cannot see these things that I'm saying to you, it's not, an, you don't have to search in your brain that something is missing. Increase your taqwa, trust in Allah, and read so that you can see, so that you can be of the liberators of mankind, so that you can understand your religion, so that you can understand that Islam is the religion of freedom, of liberation from a slavery that has taken over mankind. That Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi was a true freedom fighter, that he liberated the people as he went along, that the people came in large numbers to a society that he said, no more taxes, no more river, no more impositions, you are free. These are the rules given by God of how do we conduct our affairs. He elevated trade. He liberated people from the servitude of wages slavery as much as the servitude of anybody owning everything and having to work for them. No tax, no ruler in the name of any name can say, and I, you are forced to pay to me, except for zakat, which is given to God, which is he, the ruler, collects and distributes in 24 hours. He doesn't hold on to it because the money has to flow. That's why Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not allow, and the consequence, Sahaba, they did not have treasury. They wanted to spend and throw it and take it away, take it away, take it away. And they understood minimum has to, has to be kept in order just to run the regular expenses, but nothing above that. And there is endless, especially in Al-Andalus, you find that they refuse to have a hoarding, the hoarding of gold and silver by the government. is to keep reserves. No, no, spend it, spend it, spend it. Put it in the market, let the people use it. This is the free society that Rasul Salah Sam created, not the Islamization of capitalism. It's outrageous. It's a deformation. It's a fantasy. It's wrong. It's unacceptable. And we are here to say no. We have proven that there is an Islamic model. We have now spoken about what is riba and what the definition, the classical definition of riba. Now we are going to go a little bit further in the session that comes. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.